You're listening to RevOps FM with Justin Norris. Welcome to RevOps FM, everyone. Today, we're going to dig into how ops and strategy connect with each other, support each other, and really what it means to become more strategic as ops practitioners and leaders. And we have the right person to talk to today because our guest is Daryl Alfonso, director of both marketing strategy and operations at Indeed. He's also held former leadership roles at Amazon, Hitwise, the American Marketing Association. He's a course instructor at MarTech Alliance and the author of the MarTech Handbook and he finds time to sleep somewhere in all that. Daryl, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. I love this conversation. And yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of your thought leadership too. Thanks a lot. We appreciate that. We're, we're both in the right room. Awesome. Well, I want to just start it out by asking, how do you define the scope of marketing ops? It's kind of a thing where we all sort of know what it is generally, but it's hard to tell where it ends, where it begins. So in your various roles, how do you draw lines around that function? Yeah. So aspirationally, I think of marketing ops as the art and science of executing great marketing. So I always like to put that up on the like, like on a billboard of like the the major direction that we want to go. I think historically, marketing ops has been really the tools, metrics, and processes that enable marketing. But I think that's changing. You know, I think that both you and I grew up in that era where it was heavily based on the technology and the marketing ops role was to manage and just drive the adoption and overall use MarTech to help marketers get to their goals. It's like, that was kind of like the goal of marketing operations. I think that's changing. I think that for me, I think marketing operations has oversight into these like few key areas. One is planning and strategy. I love that. Two is technology management, which I think encompasses most of what we were talking about. Next is process design. Know, oversight over and like, how do we get campaigns out the door? What do marketers do to work with the various sides of the business to engage customers? The fourth one is analytics, like marketing, business intelligence, marketing analytics. And then finally, I like to call this business alignment. Another way to put this, Michael McKinnon, for example, calls this category support and administration. That's inevitably what it does. It's like, there's things that break, there's things that just need fixing. But for me, I like the word business alignment because it encompasses all the little things that you need to do so that the entire go-to-market function works together smoothly. That, I think, is the future of marketing operations, those five categories. I want to give a shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, Knack. You know, I love marketing automation software, but let's be honest, the email and landing page builders are usually terrible. You can't make it nice without a developer, and marketers are going to find a way to break things or go off brand. You do not have time for that. So Knack is totally different. You set the guidelines and then give your users a building experience that's slick, modern, and beautiful. When they're done, everything goes to your map at the push of a button. And don't worry, it supports global teams, approval workflows. It's got your integrations. So head on over to revops.fm forward slash NAC. That's K-N-A-K. And get a special offer just for my listeners. I think you're right that historically we've been kind of IT for marketing, you know, really focused on that tooling category. And now more and more, and I've seen you post about this and other people talk about it, something I've spoken about, kind of coming out of that bubble and expanding to other areas of the business. Do you feel as a discipline that we are struggling with that process or do you feel that it's it's moving along the way that it should? I think that the business as a whole, businesses in general, are calling out for us as marketing operators to step into that role. I think that the biggest opportunity right now, or maybe even gap, is that Many marketing ops people, even really smart ones, are a little bit reluctant to step into it. I think that, you know, I love the technology. I was a Marketo cha- two-time Marketo champion back in the day. And that means that I love figuring out how to solve problems. I love to build. You know, that's what I think for a, lo- a lot of people get attracted to marketing operations in the, in the first place. I've always said that if you're doing marketing automation with a platform that's capable of supporting what you want to do, I think that it's really just pseudo programming, you know, and we are architecting these solutions. And that is very compelling and so interesting. And that's what originally drew me to the, to the profession. Me too. But I think that, yeah, I think that it's the same for a lot of technical experts that we can fall 
into the trap of falling in love with just this specific part. And doing a good job with the technology is where we stop. And that's what we aspire to. And that, I think, is the biggest between where marketing operators are and where they should be. And it's going to take many of us, you know, I think I think myself and many other people in the space, we are advocating that marketing operators step up, like not away from the technology, but to bring up the technology into the business, into the business objectives and overall into the customer experience. And that's what I think, that, that's where I think the gap is. Within technology, things are very black and white. You know, it works or it doesn't work. It passes or it fails. It's a one or a zero. Obviously, there's issues around communication and does it meet requirements and lots of ambiguity, but it's kind of a place of, of safety and it creates a buffer between marketers who are responsible for business results and, you know, ops people who are, I do the tech, I enable you. If it doesn't work, it's your problem. Now, once we step more into planning and strategy, that buffer is harder to maintain. There's actually a much greater accountability. You are more on the line for business results. And that can be a scary thing for people that either started out as marketers and maybe didn't like that aspect of it or just didn't start there and, and find that intimidating. Do you think there's any truth to that? A little bit. I think that there's maybe some truth in that it can be a little bit scary to hold ourselves accountable to things that maybe we haven't been held accountable to before or that to things that we can't really control. My theory, like, and I, I was reading up on this earlier, my theory is that the big issue is actually marketing operations has an allegiance to the craft. And what I mean by that is that we feel that it's our role and it's only our role to build a world-class tech stack or build world-class processes. And that's the end to itself, which can be fairly noble, you know, especially if you're maybe in the consulting space or maybe a little bit on the academic side where you just kind of study it for the sake of it. But what you're lacking, I think, is the overall ownership that's required. And that's where kind of leadership comes into play. Like, it's not enough, like you said, for this binary outcome to happen. It's more of we need to work together with the different sides of the group to make sure the business is successful. And if that sometimes means doing things that's not aligned with what we feel is world-class marketing operations, then we have a responsibility to our organizations and to our customers to do that. I agree with you completely. It's a shift in focus from being a craftsperson, a technician, and we still need those things. And I should say also for the benefit of anyone listening, I think as an individual, it's completely valid to say, actually, that's who I am. I am a technical architect. That's the role that I want to play in this whole machine. You know, that's where I excel. And I can understand that completely. But for the function as a whole, I think it has to do more and it has to be impact oriented. And that's what I'm taking away from what you're saying, that it's not enough to say, I, I built this really nice tech stack. My marketing team missed its goals, but my tech stack is spotless. That's not a good outcome for the business, obviously. Well, yeah. And you and I have talked about this before. And while you're right, it's, you know, admirable and a, and a good job to to be that sort of like technical expert or subject matter expert. What What we see a lot of times, especially with people progressing in their career, is they get into this like, woe is me type and mentality of like, I'm doing a good job, but everyone else doesn't recognize it. I'm doing a good job but marketing leadership doesn't appreciate me. And that's that to me is not the place that you want to be in. You know, it's a very like, I don't want to say learned helplessness, but it's something along those lines. Here's something that I've realized in my journey through leadership and especially stepping into leadership roles. If you have the opinion that if only this other group or if only someone else would change the way that they're working, everything would be fine. That's not the right attitude to have. And yep. that's, the, that's, the type of me- that's the type of message that I'm trying to, to send to marketing ops people is like, yeah, times are tough. And yeah, it's difficult for non-technical folk to understand the value of our work and why it's so important, but it's not their fault. And if we need to lead the way in sort of bringing together and marrying strategy, execution, impact, and technology, then I think we are the ones to do it. And we should do it. Couldn't agree with you more. We have to see ourselves as having agency. 
in that process and not just being the victims of other people's ignorance or lack of appreciation or anything like that. You talked about, you know, the message you're trying to communicate. And I was looking at your LinkedIn profile in preparation for this discussion and was struck by how many of your earlier roles were actually in pure marketing or even in communications. Like you had a communications, right? And I haven't seen that many people go from comms to ops. And and so I was just wondering about what that transition looked like for you. Are you drawing upon that today? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think that, you know, early on in my career, I, to be honest, I just wanted to, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I really just wanted to get a high paying marketing job, you know, <laughs> and uh, I didn't have as much experience. You know, when you're like, you're out of college and you just have a couple years in some sort of like analyst or just generalist roles and those don't pay too well. I saw that, oh, you know what? Like if I owned the marketing automation platform, was able to build a tech stack for people, not only is it pretty well paid, but it's highly respected. Like you get included in a lot of, like a lot of top level meetings, even with, even with not too much experience. And that was kind of like my first entrance into, you, you know, this builder mentality. I'm like, well, wow, I really like that. I did start to, you know, like at Hitwise, for example, I had a very marketing role where I oversaw sales development as well as general marketing and demand gen. But at, with small teams, you can always have your interest, I think. And I've always been interested in operations. But I think because I've always kind of straddled those two roles and I've always t taken a particular interest in communication, it's really helped me, I think, get to this kind of stage. I really do think that the missing skill set that requires that jump from let's say marketing operations practitioner to marketing operations leader is more than 90% communication. I, I really I really think it is. In my last role at, at AWS, I think that one of the challenges that I had was I almost kind of pigeonholed myself as a technologist. I admittedly started to fall into that trap of I'm doing things the right way. Like, why isn't everything falling into place? It must be the other people. And I think that shift for me when I moved over to Indeed into an even higher leadership role and, and more oversight into strategy, into people leadership, I doubled down on this theory that if I could improve my communication skills, I think I could grow my career. And it's proved right so far. One last thing I'll mention about that is that I think when you study communication and people, what happens is you're better able to translate what's happening. And I think that that's been a really big one for me too, being able to translate what the data means, what the technology means, what happens if all of the work, all of the great work that we as marketing operators do, what happens if that doesn't take place? What happens if that doesn't occur? What's the impact to the business? And I've been really happy with the progress that I've made, that my team's made because of this shift in mindset. And there's a great lesson there. I think of every marketing operations senior leader that I know in my personal network at the director level, the VP level, or even just people that I see on LinkedIn. And this ability to communicate is a common theme for all of them. I look at the work that I do in my own team and it's the same thing. And I think maybe part of the challenge is you feel if you're just like coming back to that commitment to craft, if you're a craftsperson, you feel I'm just going to do my best work and people will notice it. And it can feel a little bit uncomfortable to toot your own horn or to appear to be self-promotional so people can shy away from that. But I think you can't just wait around for people to recognize it. You have to go out there and explain the value. And now, in many ways, I view that as the most important part of my job with anything that we're doing in my team or like if I'm working with another member of the marketing ops team on a task, it's like, all right, what is the impact? What is the story? Like thinking ahead, presenting this to the rest of the team once it's all said and done, which is not just the communications aspect, but it really does ground you in what is the impact that I'm having and make sure that you're not wasting your time. So I think there's a double benefit there as well. Yeah. To the point that you made around like, hey, I'm worried that it's self-promotional. I don't think of it that way. I did think of it that way, but I don't anymore. What I more think about is it's like a sports team, whether it's soccer, football, or basketball, a team communicating to each other about what's happening. If you're calling out a play, if you're yelling out to your teammate to watch out for something, if you're guiding them to do something because you're going to score at the end, if you don't say anything, none of that happens. Your teammates don't know what's happening and you're sort of guessing how the entire play will play out on the field. And that's how I consider doing things like a marketing operations QBR, presentations, demo days, interviewing stakeholders, speaking up at all hands meetings, speaking up at leadership meetings. That's what we're doing. 
we're calling things out and we're doing so in service of the mission. So if any of your listeners are wary about being too self-promotional, I think that they should consider the danger of not communicating. And that danger is very real. Yep. Just be the person down the end zone waiting to get the ball and no one knows they're there, you know? Yeah. And what do you say? Like, well, I did my part. I'm here. It must be everyone else that's wrong, right? It must be everybody else. And that's it's not true. Let's dive deeper into strategy and operations. I'm so interested in this topic because, you know, we have a business culture that privileges strategy. Like being strategic is inherently a compliment. It's a positive thing. Everybody wants to be strategic. And now you're here in a role wearing both hats. I've seen some people do this before, so it's not unheard of, but it's also not super common. So I'm just curious for you, what does it mean? How do you define your role? How, how do these two things come together in the work that you do? In short, I really think that strategy is about answering tough questions with the choices that you're going to make. I love the definition of strategy as the set of choices that we make in service of some objective, right? Because if you choose to do something, you are by default choosing not to do something else, right? If you mm -hmm. choose Marketo, you've not chosen Pardot, you've not chosen Harspot. If you choose a, a centralized single source of truth strategy, you're, you're not choosing you know, a, a different version of a data strategy. So, so strategy is choice. The other thing that people don't get about strategy is that there's different levels because choices are made at every level. So if you think about the company strategy about like which markets we should enter, which products that we, we should produce, and which customers should we target, those are like really big strategies, right? When it comes to the marketing section, the marketing might be tactics in service of the company level strategy. But for us marketers, this is the strategy. So at each level, the tactics become the strategy. So that's like a really interesting concept that, yeah. that I, I try to explain to people. So what that leads me to say is that when it comes to marketing, when I'm overseeing operations, I'm all also overseeing the choices in which we make in order to try to achieve our marketing goals. And these strategies could be something like, do we take a centralized or decentralized approach to the way that we do campaign building? Who builds it? Is it regional pods of people? You know, at AWS, for example, anyone could build largely decentralized, you know, at Microsoft, at least, you know, when I talk to my colleagues over there, they have a big centralized organization, right? They call this global demand center. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like a choice that you have to make. And you do that based on the factors that are specific to your org. You know, do you have the talent to do it? What's the tooling look like? Are the tools centralized and standardized so that anyone can use it? If not, you know, or if, if it requires some technical talent, you know, you, you probably should, should move to more of a centralized function. I, I think that there's a number of those questions that, you know, people have this wrong impression that there's like one gold standard way of doing marketing operations. <laughs> It's just not, it's not true, not true at all. One of the things that I'm working on right now is like this concept of like, what's our mix, right? What's our mix of people that build campaigns? What's our mix of internal talent, external talent, like an agency, for example, that typically have a little bit more technical skills, right? They know some coding, maybe they know some, some development. And then, you know, maybe some contracting talent, like people we bring on specifically for this. Like, what's that right mix that, that, I'm, that I'm trying to get to? Right now, and it's not kind of firm, but I love the idea that for some of our largest campaigns, like let's say user conference, let's say customer-wide nurture for all prospects coming into the funnel, large thematic campaigns that we do, I think that those should be hand-in-hand -hand attached to internal employees. You know, I think that number one, they can be in all the meetings with all of these people. They can get ahead of the strategy. And the other thing that a lot of people don't think about is it's really good for their careers if they are able to solve these tough problems that have high visibility. There are some other stuff that, for some reason, marketing leaders just don't understand why it's valuable. A lot of the administration work, a lot of the behind the scenes data work, that's perfect opportunity for an agency. You know what I mean? Like the agency can do it. They're typically a little bit more technical then your talent, like they can source these technical experts pretty quickly. So they're a nice fit to do some of those things. And then for some of the like standard, I would say run of the mill campaigns, we can look elsewhere for other talent, maybe contractor talent, freelancer talent. But I'm not saying like this is the right way for everyone. But what I'm saying is this is strategy. 
It's questions. Right. Like, how do we approach these things? And that's that's what strategy and operations means to me. I love what you're saying about the hierarchy of strategy and tactics, because I've always chewed on this for a while, because I'm really big at having clear definitions just in terms of how I think. Like, well, one person's strategy is the next person's tactics, depending on which level that you're working on it. That makes perfect sense to me. Now, what you've described, I'd almost call it like an operational strategy, like given a certain objective and given a certain set of decisions to continue your definition of strategy is making choices. A certain set of choices have already been made. We are going to run X campaigns. We are going to do a user conference. Now, how should we best support that in terms of the team structure, the roles and responsibilities, the technology? That is downstream of those decisions that have already been made. Does your role encompass some of those upstream decisions as well, or is it really marketing strategy and operations, meaning strategy in the ops context? Some of the larger, let's say big rock initiatives don't happen at my level, right? They'll happen at like the VP level. Should we do a user conference? You know, should we spend X million of dollars on this channel versus this channel, right? I think that a lot of the work that my team does and in partnership with other groups, we inform and like we help collaborate on those decisions. I think that making those possible like reaching the OKRs of our business. I think that that's more of the strategy realm that my team plays. I will say that, and this is common at other organizations too, is we also have a planning function, right? Like it's a planning and strategy function that's actually separate from marketing operations. They kind of report up to the CMO. A lot of them, a common, a common one is like chief of staff. Mm -hmm. so chief of staff, like we have a chief of staff and then she also has a team. This is also marketing operations, just a different side of it. And that team's work stream is the one that sets the path to create the strategy. The format in which that happens is there's a timeline. It's like a really big project where the company's goals and overall resourcing is developed. And then there's a cascade of actions and decisions that have to be made after that. So after the company decides what their OKRs are, for example, the marketing team needs to determine what their strategic plan is alongside of what those OKRs are. After the OKRs and strategy is developed, then we need to have the budgeting conversation and the resourcing conversation of what do we need to make that happen. Following that comes the more tactical things like the campaigns. What campaigns do we need? The campaigns, either in tandem with marketing operations or like soon after, we, we come up with the operational strategy because the operational strategy needs to support the campaign strategy. All in all, there's an entire work stream that's not the responsibility of my team today, but it does fall in what I do think is marketing operations. So it's like a different side. Let's dive into that and like make it real for a second. Company level strategy, you know, we're going to grow X amount through, you know, getting new people onto our platform and we're also going to try to increase existing business by X or something. Am I like something like that? Is that what we're thinking about for those company level OKRs? And then for, in terms of how marketing supports that, is that where we start thinking about, all right, well, what are the main channels that we're going to focus on? Paid, organic, main programs? Like, how, Is that where that sort of thinking starts cascading in? Yeah, I think you're right on. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. One is for like a straightforward way to do this, there's actually a wonderful framework in Michael McKinnon's book. He wrote a book called The Marketing Operations Handbook, which I recommend to people. And the framework is like a demand planning framework where you take a look at what the revenue of the company should be, you know, the new sales revenue, for example. And then you find out marketing's contribution. What's marketing's contribution? So then you have a number. That number then needs to be made up by you know, you, you need a certain amount of pipeline to make up that number, a certain amount of leads to make up that number, and then a certain amount of programs or campaigns that you run throughout the year. So there's this very like trickle down hierarchy effect yeah. that you can do um, with reverse math. And that's that's the planning that I recommend. I caveat that by saying we're in an interesting era these days, especially with PLG and especially with companies like mine that are more of like a marketplace business. So with a marketplace business, you have both B2B and B2C. And then what's really interesting, I think, for Indeed, without sharing too much of like what's going on, not only do we have B2B and B2C, but we also have an enterprise and SMB motion. So all of those are very different and they don't work the same, right? Because like if a small business uses Indeed, it's fairly simple. 
you know what I mean? You can sponsor a job and put a credit card in and you're good to go. Yeah. So that is a, almost like a SMB PLG type function, right? There's not too much sales assist that you need, even though there can be. We also have an enterprise motion where you have large companies that are hiring thousands of employees in a certain time period, you know, like in a quarter, they'll hire a thousand people. That's a very different game, right? And it requires that sort of white glove, high touch service that a sales led motion does. So while I say that I wish it could be as simple as what I just mentioned in terms of like the framework for, for planning, um, in reality, especially with today, it's very tricky. But I will say that it's a lot of fun too. These are problems that people haven't, like there's nothing written about how to solve this. So this is where the strategy comes in. You know, how do we solve these problems and how do we, how do we plan for it? It's funny now that you mentioned it. About 10 years ago, my first kind of real startup job, it was a hiring app. They layered some software and some profiling tools on top of the job posting piece, but they partnered with companies like Indeed to get their postings out. So I know exactly what you're talking about with that. It was primarily SMB focused in the beginning, although they started to layer that enterprise motion in. And so is your team supporting all of those things? together? And then there's the candidate marketing side as well, which I don't, you didn't mention, but maybe are you thinking about all those things or are you really focused just on the enterprise play? A good portion of my team is really dedicated to the B2B, both enterprise and small business, because I think marketing operations really lends itself to that type of marketing and that to that type of customer. B2C, in my opinion, is a little bit different. Like the planning is a little bit different. The measurement is different. We do help in those areas and we partner really closely with the team that runs campaigns against our, we call them job seeker customers. But I will say the type of work is very different. So the, the large focus of my team is B2B. We've mentioned your team a few times. Can you tell us a bit about how big is Indeed? How big is marketing? How big is marketing ops? And then how do you structure your roles? Indeed's an interesting one. And it's very different than like my last organization. Like at AWS, for example, I was on the MarTech team. My team was like the Marketo team, had a large team that really managed Marketo as a product, but also managed the way in which marketers use the platform. Here it's different. Indeed's about, I don't know, 14 to 15,000 people. And the marketing technology responsibility actually, actually falls under a different team called business systems. Right. Kind of like a, you know, most places would call it probably IT, but we call it business systems. So my team actually doesn't manage the MarTech. My team has like three different groups. So we have a campaign operations team, which heavily focuses on email. We have a globalization team. I like to say that the mission of that team is to expand marketing efforts and scale marketing efforts to many of the different regions. There's a lot that goes into that. It's been a really fun journey for me inheriting that team because it's the new must for me. But a lot of it is around localizing and translating and adapting the campaigns and content that we have for, you know, to be culturally relevant and market relevant for, for customers in different and that places sits that within are, aren't in the U.S. It's not a like global service department for the entire company. It's specifically a marketing localization function that you're running. That's interesting. I also have an enablement group. And enablement focuses on MarTech rollouts, MarTech adoption, campaign processes, optimization, and then a little bit of reporting too. So my team is about 13 people and we would support those different groups. And so from your point of view, the business systems team is actually the, the product managers of your tools and you are their clients on behalf of the marketers that you serve. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Like, like do you yeah, interface, the, like if they need a new feature, like, hey, we need a new enrichment or scoring or something in Marketo, let's say, would they go through you to business systems or do marketers interface with business systems directly? It's a little bit blurry. I would say that the way it works at my company is that marketers are the primary customers of that business systems group. That group is made up of product managers, engineers, and analysts. So let's say, for example, there's a technical need or requirement, such as standing up a tool, integrations, or maybe redoing our data strategy. That falls squarely in their remit. I think that what's interesting, and it's it's something that I'm learning about and, and I've also been like just curious about, is whose responsibility is it to get the most potential out of the tools and have, have the most adoption and make sure that the marketers are doing things in the most efficient and streamlined way. If you have a team whose overarching objective is to make sure 
that the tools are in a ready state for marketers, who does enablement fall under? Who does uh, empowerment fall under? And I think right now, you know, and I have a wonderful relationship with leadership of that team, and we meet on a regular basis. Right now, I, I would say that it's it's split between the two. It's split between my team, and we have great experience too in in Martech, and their team is the one that has the engineers. And so that's that's the dynamic that that we have it played. I often think like fast forward five, 10 years, and I'm the one that gets to make the, <laughs> hopefully, I'm the one that gets to make these large organizational calls. I, I often ask myself, like, how would I set it up? I I'm not sure that. that I would set it up in this way. Yeah. But I will say that we've established a dynamic that I think is very collaborative and works for us. You took it just where I was going to go because like pros and cons, you know, the business system's ownership structure is one I've seen increasingly in larger companies. You can see why they would do it that way. You have one team that owns all your systems. They can manage the interrelationships between them. They can be product managers on behalf of the whole company. So let's say those are the arguments or some of them in favor. The cons, of course, become, do they then become less responsive to particular groups? Do they become more distant from those groups, less able to interpret questions? Marketing worries that their needs may go to the back of the queue because the team also has to service Salesforce and sales tools, and maybe sales has more power in the organization. So you've already said, you know, you wouldn't necessarily set it up that way. What do you think is the best way to set it up if you were to design an enterprise from scratch? I try to like remove my own biases, which is like really difficult. And I think the strongest biases for most of us is to bring to a company what we're familiar with, whether or not it was the right choice to begin with. I recognize that my biases is that the MarTech technology team should report up into marketing because I've seen it before and that's been where most of my experience is. I think that there are some benefits to that. Like I think the alignment would be incredibly tight. And I also think that type of organization attracts technologists that have a affinity for marketing, you know, that they really enjoy marketing. And whereas when you separate it out, I think you may get maybe more general technologists and engineers that are excellent from a technical standpoint, but they may not have an interest in the overarching goals that marketing is trying to achieve. They, they more of just want to deliver technical excellence. So that's probably how I would set it up. I would I would set it up as MarTech leading up into like a CMO or a VP of digital or something like that. However, I will say where this gets tricky is that the larger your organization is, the more development resources you typically need. So you need teams of engineers and product managers. Marketers are not the best, I would say, at developing that sort of talent. And you need that talent to be good. And you need, you need them to develop best-in-class solutions for you. So that, I think, is the downside of not having developers, engineers, product managers reporting up into like a technical leader, several layers of technical leadership. That, I think, gets into the whole like organization and management. How do you manage a large technical organization? Are marketers the best people to do that, like marketing leaders? I don't know. I don't think it's impossible, but I... I recognize the trade-off. I'm still forming an opinion, I think, on what I would officially do. <laughs> and I think I have time before I get there anyway. It's an interesting problem. I have a recorded episode with Sanford Whiteman. We talk about that problem of, you know, you have really smart developers who do a really bad job with marketing use cases because they are either indifferent to the needs of the marketing discipline that they're serving in that case, or kind of looking down a little bit on the technologies because they're often client side, like having to do JavaScript or you know having to think about the way that marketing tools interact, sometimes with, with real-time web activity that it's very different than the way a lot of other tools are. It's not a question of developer skill or engineering skill, but there really is a need for this marketing developer. But you make a really good point about technical resources also need an org structure to surround them. They need peers, they need leadership. Yes. That's not something that they'll find often in a marketing team. Yeah. I mean, it's the same question. Like, it's the same downsides of like, where should the sales development team sit in marketing or in mm -hmm. in sales, right? Most marketers, me included, think that we should selfishly want them to report up into, into marketing for better alignment. And I think it's a good move. 
But many sales development people, they aspire to be account executives. They aspire to be directors of sales later on. And, you know, you have to find a way because now that they're not in sales, you, you're kind of robbing them a little bit of that nurturing and the coaching that typically gets from like, if you actually sit in a team. So always, there's always trade-offs. Yeah. I love that one that you just described, the sales development one. In my own organization, when I joined, we had BDR teams, some reporting into sales, some reporting into marketing in different places. Some of them reported into me for a little while while we were hiring a new leader in a particular region. And my team's also responsible for BDR ops. And now they all do report into sales. We have that consistent, which I think is good for the reasons that you mentioned, where you know those those BDRs are not going to grow up and become marketers most of the time. They're going to grow up and become AEs and account managers, and, and they're going to move into the revenue work. But I think the thing that makes it work, at least, is that we have marketers that still view interfacing with and guiding the activities of the BDR team as very much their responsibility, regardless of you know reporting structure and that sort of thing. And we have those conversations and everyone's very involved. So I think there's ways of kind of having your cake and eat it too, irrespective of how the org is structured, but it does require intentionality in that area. Yeah. I mean, I think that like it does work. You know what I mean? I think the leaders of those groups, they need to care and they need to understand, yep. you know, like sales development and sales is a completely different animal because there's a lot of like personal motivation, I think, at stake and like that needs to be nurtured that isn't necessarily present in more technical roles. There's a, an interface there. And I think that there's the same thing with technical talent where they aspire to solve tougher and tougher problems. And you have to balance that with the need to drive impact, but you can't ignore it. You can't ignore that these are the people's desires, strengths, and talents that need to be cultivated. So if you have a leader that can do that, I think it'll work. But oftentimes with many leaders, we, myself included, we gravitate toward what we really like. And mm -hmm. sometimes we forget about the stuff that is, isn't as important to us. I want to ask you just sort of switching topics completely, just about building a personal brand and marketing operations. I see you as someone who's been you know, tremendously successful with this. You have upwards of 40,000 followers on LinkedIn. You, you know, very present in the community. You're doing these monthly marketing huddles, you wrote a book, you teach a class. So it's like clear that you're really involved here. I'm just curious for your take on how do you approach this? Are you just, you love doing this stuff and it's all happening organically? Is it a strategy that you have? How important is it for people out there that are kind of like, ah, should I invest time in doing this? What is your thought? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to like keep this concise because I have a lot to say on this topic. But I will say that, you know, I became recognized for my work kind of early. I became like a Marketo champion a little bit younger, maybe, than some of the others. Like not young, young, but like a little bit younger. And so I got introduced to that world of being like a thought leader or someone that people look up to early on. And as I was like joining the, the group of Marketo champions at the time, I just couldn't help but think like, I want more than this, like more than just being able to teach people what the best practices of Marketo are, or like setting up, you know, teaching people how to clean their database and stuff like that. Like I wanted to forward the industry, like I wanted to forward our work. And I felt like one of the only ways to do that was, was to kind of spread out. Like, why does it have to be specific to this platform? There's so many people that are just like me using a different system, you know? So I, th I think that was the first thing of trying to look at marketing operations as an industry rather than just like these individual pockets of platform enthusiasts, you know? So, so I stepped out and I think I was like one of the first ones to start doing that, to start like writing about the industry as a whole and not like, hey, just like platform specific stuff that you need. No. Yeah. The, the next thing that I will say, consistency for sure, like being being able to like Consistently teach is a big part of it. I would say that some of my success in personal branding was because I caught on a little bit early to that social phenomenon of creating content that people like. And that is not something that just comes naturally. I think the first thing that I did, I remember when Instagram was first a thing and I, you know, I don't really use Instagram today, but when Instagram was first a thing, I started. I started to post some pictures and I started to see just by like looking that there was a few things that I did that would boost the engagement 
of the photos. Number one, like it had to be good. It had to stand out. But number two, the social interactions helped a lot. Like if I would interact with others, they would also interact with me. So I caught Mm -hmm. that just like, I just like discovered that even though people were like, I didn't even mean to. And then when I, when I moved on to LinkedIn, I followed that same thing because I kind of knew coming from another platform that a lot of the writing is for your audience. Like, you know, they're coming across your writing. If you don't grab their attention, they're just going to ignore it. And then secondly, this concept of community is a really big one. Like you have to engage with others and that that pulls people in too. So I think that if you ever get advice that personal branding is just something that you, people don't think about and it just like you get lucky and you just keep doing it over time, you'll do it, you'll, you'll get it. I really don't believe that. I think that there is a lot actually of science to it. And that if any of your listeners are interested in building platforms and building followings, you actually have to study it. You can't just show up every day. Like, I, I, I don't believe that advice, actually. Has it helped your career? O- obviously, the writing a book, those things are, are inherently helpful. But in terms of the efforts that you've put in, aside from the personal gratification and all that sort of intangible stuff, but just from a career perspective, do you think it's been important? The interesting thing, when I moved to, I think when I was at AWS, I was a little bit more private. It's hard to be private when you're posting. But like, I didn't, I kind of kept those things separate. You know, my life at AWS and then my life as, you know, like a content creator on on LinkedIn. When I came to Indeed, I brought it together. I was not shy about letting people know that this is what I do. And I got a lot of credibility for that, even up at to the highest levels. You know, I'm so fortunate. I'll get a note from my CMO, you know, every now and then saying, hey, I read your last post. It really resonated with me. And like, it's awesome. I, I am just... I'm just so grateful to to be at a place, a, a culture like this, but also people that like accept the type of work that I do and really think highly of it. I 100% it, think it did. I will say the other thing that it does, it just exposes you to really smart peers. And if you do that, it saves you a lot of time. You know, I remember asking you questions, asking Paul Wilson questions. Asking people like, you know, like just cow questions and they probably would still make time for me if, you know, I didn't do all this content creation stuff. But I like to think that the one, one of the reasons why I've developed relationships like that, that have been very, very, you know, instrumental, I think, in, in my work and in the way that I think, I, I can't help but think that my personal brand has a lot to do with it. I love what you said, the two things. But I'll just tag on at the end that I've observed as well are, you know, sometimes it can be hard to be heard internally in certain discussions. And yet if you go out and make a post on that same thing and it gets a lot of validation, can actually be a really powerful way of persuading internal audiences as well, which we don't often think about. We think of like, we're going to go out there so I can get to something else. But actually, if you can't get your voice in in a meeting, you can still get it out there on LinkedIn and the people will sort of vote in a way and help validate that idea. And that brings it to the second thing that I just really like is it is really a, a marketplace of ideas in many ways. And I know obviously some people coming in, they, they have advantages, they have big audiences, but if you have something compelling to say and and you grab people's attention, like you said, then... Um, and people kind of can tell you what resonates with them. And I just really like that. I like the immediate, reminded me of when I was email marketing, you sent out a campaign and uh, and I was selling things that people could buy with a credit card. It's like, you can just tell right away whether it's working or not. Something about the immediacy of that, that I really like. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think my last thing I will say is like, I think about personal branding and building a following differently because they there's just a ton of overlap. Like you can build an an amazing personal brand without a following. As long as people know you and know that you do great work and they appreciate the work that you do, you you can do that in one-on-one conversations. And many have built great careers from, from that. Building a following, in my opinion, is different. And there's a lot of perks and things. Like there's a lot of external perks that come from the following, but they are different. Like, I think that my personal brand or I guess following would have been different if I had just started a blog and then just wrote these things in a vacuum, right? Of just the thoughts that I think that people should know and my experiences. Like, I think it it would have been useful to some people, but the feedback that you get from writing things and understanding what resonates 
That's what propels it in an upward spiral. But it also changes the way you think about things too. So I think that we have to recognize that, you know, that that the content that we create, we we kind of create with our audience. Like it's 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 all it's things put together. So it's different than I think a personal brand. That's a beautiful note to end on. Daryl, this was super interesting. We could probably continue for another hour, but we'll have to chat again. I really appreciate you making the time and just thinking through these things with me. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on, Justin. Anytime. Hey, everyone. I want to invite you over to the RevOps FM Substack community, where you can sign up to get rough transcripts, show notes, longer form articles, and other bonus content. Just head over to revops.fm slash subscribe to get free access. I'd also love to know what you thought of the episode and to hear suggestions for topics you want to learn about. Feel free to leave a comment on Substack or send me an email at justin at revops.fm. Thanks for listening.